What's up, Prime Fan? We are back with episode two of Barbell Savage here again with Dylan Smith, and we are going to do a special Q&A today. So it's a couple days before Christmas, and we want to just have some fun this episode. So we asked for questions, and I actually cut this off in like an hour and a half. We got enough questions. I've actually not read any of these, neither has Dylan, and we're going to go through Q&A completely off the top of our heads where nothing is prepared. We may rant a little bit. We may talk a lot of it. We may talk a little bit about these questions. We have 10 questions we're going to go through. Uh, and as always, because it is the second episode, and some of you guys are probably seeing this for the first time, actually. Dylan, do you want to just give yourself a quick intro, and then we'll dive into the Q&A. Who are you as a coach and as a lifter? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Dylan Smith. My company is Uncommon Strength, and I operate uh, out of the Northern Virginia area. I live in Noakesville, Virginia, uh, about an hour outside of D.C., and I uh, have been competing in powerlifting since about 2011, uh, competing in bodybuilding for the first time this past June. And uh, Brendan and I have known each other for quite some time at this point. And we both coached each other and we like to nerd out and talk training. So that's why we're on here with you guys. So we can have some of those talks publicly, record them and get some of your input. The most important thing to know about Dylan is he can bench 500 pounds, the, the, the highest attribute of your, your qualities. Um, okay, guys, let's dive into this, this Q&A. Um, so let me open this email here on my phone. So we purposely had my editor actually pick these out because I didn't want to read them ahead of time. And I want this to be a little bit more organic because sometimes, ironically, having things less prepared tends to give off better answers than when you like overly analyze and prepare ahead of time. So we're going to dive into this. I'll tell you what, on this first one. I'll read it off. I'll let you go first and I'll give my input and we can switch back and forth who takes the first spot. Um, Cause I have a feeling we're going to agree on quite a bit. So like, yeah, whoever goes first gets a little advantage. Is there a time limit on these? What's that? Is there a time limit or it's just uncapped? It's uncapped. Just fucking go as long as you want. All right. Question <laughs> one. How do you determine an athlete's needed frequency on the squat bench and dead? Is it individual mostly, or are there general rules you follow in regards to beginner, intermediate, and advanced? So the most important thing I'm going to look at is what has that lifter been doing? Yeah. Because if the lifter comes to me and they have only been squatting one day per week, it's not that I can't take them into a three-day-per-week squat protocol but I just need to ease them into that a little bit more versus a lifter who has been regularly squatting three days per week. If it's an intermediate to advanced lifter who knows their body well and they're able to give me uh, some feedback such as any time they have pushed uh, X amount of volume or X amount of frequency in a certain lift that it tends to run them into the ground a little bit, then I'll take that feedback and uh, the more advanced they are, the more I'll listen to it, the more novice they are. <laughs> but I will always take that feedback into consideration and I'll apply that to whatever we're doing moving forward. If I'm just beginning off a novice power lifter, let's say someone who has been in the gym, they've been training for a regular basis for let's say at least like a year or two, and they decided they wanted to dip their toes into powerlifting. They haven't done any real powerlifting specific training, but they've been in the gym. Mm -hmm. A general place to start would probably be a two to three per week squat frequency. Same thing on the bench and a one to two on the deadlift. I don't yeah. think that's going to come as any surprise to anyone. Uh, but then from there, just really paying attention to how that individual responds and making, making changes over time. So, um, I definitely have some advanced lifters. I know I have one guy, Ryan Kicker, who uh, is currently over in Thailand, who only squats and deads uh, and, and he only benches twice per week. He has a twice per week frequency of, of every lift, actually. Um, and frequently, it'll only be a once per week comp deadlift and a variation. on. What is this deadlift. clone Jason Bourne version of you? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, <laughs> a lot of people end up thinking we're brothers cause, or, or that we're the same person because we actually look so similar. Uh, but yeah, so he, he's a good example of someone who thrives on kind of a uh, really a lower volume and a lower frequency protocol. I, I can tell you that if I did the exact training that he's doing, it, it would not quite be enough training volume for me, um, especially on my on my upper body. But he really he thrives there. Uh, so there are going to be individual differences, and it's important to walk yourself into those higher frequencies if you're starting off coming out of a lower frequency program and definitely to take good notes as you log your training over the weeks and months so that you can get a feel for what works best for you. Don't think that more is better. 
three or four times per week on, on a squat isn't necessarily going to be better than once or twice per week. You need to figure out what works best for you. And that may change depending upon where you're at in your training, uh, not just in your uh, particular training cycle, but it may change based on where you're at in your training career. You know, what worked really well for you five years ago may not work for you well 10 mm-hmm. years from now. That's that's such good points. And I agree with all that, uh, like 100 percent. Yeah, I think first thing you have to look at is where they're at. And that's always a on. I think both of our questionnaires, I'm sure, has that question with new athletes applying. Yeah. So um, really, OK, a couple things here for me to to like make this a little bit more like regimented for the coaches and whatnot out there. I really view frequency in a paradigm of like volume spread out throughout a week more than I do as like you know, I think some people look at frequency, like the more, the better, because the more practice on the barbell, right? So if I'm squatting three times a week, you get to practice a squat or a squat variation three times a week and your technique can be better improved. But I really don't look at frequency as a modulator of uh, like outcome like that. Rather, I look at frequency as a modulator of like the volume you want to lay out in a program. So like, for instance, I would die on three times a week squats with like, decently high like rep volume especially and like pushing exertion a little bit yet i have done as dylan knows and many of you know um like six to seven day a week squatting just up to a single a max single and i actually feel amazing on that so right there is kind of proof that it's it's less about the frequency when it comes to like fucking you up and or, or producing results or whatever. And it's more about like the amount of volume you're accumulating. So like, you know, hard sets of 10 on squat. Like a lot of people I think think if you do like an all out max grinder, even like you might do on like a Bulgarian method that that is inherently more taxing than like an easy set of 10 on squat. And that's not true. Like the set of 10 induces so much adaptation uh, from a muscular tension standpoint, CNS, they actually have a ton of scientific data now that shows higher reps are much more CNS demanding than lower reps, contrary to what they used to say back in the day. And there's just a lot of emerging data on that. So really, I look at frequency as a, a modulator of the volume in your training split. So like what I try to figure out, too, is and, and I know Dylan also does this is, OK, how many squat sets per week does this person need? And what else do they need on bench press and deadlift? And then what like frequency slash split makes the most sense with that? So for instance, like I might find on a bench press that the way we have squat and deadlift set up kind of necessitates like a high frequency approach, even though I wouldn't normally do that with the client. If there was like other parameters, I was not being forced to engage with. So what I mean by that is like, I might have someone that I need to have them bench four times a week because I can only give them so much volume per session the way I have the rest of the program set up as where if like that wasn't the case, I might actually have them bench just three times a week and do a little bit more volume and exertion on one day to push stimulus more. So I think it really kind of depends on those variables, but I will give people like a hard tangible answer because I know they want something a little bit more tactile. Generally speaking, I would say that my most common frequency I give out is three times a week squat two times a week deadlift and three times a week bench press. Um, there are athletes I have that, you know, like Dylan said that just I actually me myself, I'm starting to realize the more advanced I get like funny enough bench press. I need lower frequency on cause I just get beat on that lift as where um, deadlifts. I'm, I'm pretty sure if I wanted to, not necessarily that it would be better. I think I can handle like three times a week deadlift. No problem. Um, but yeah, I, I really try to, figure out all the surrounding variables and kind of make it congruent there. And I, I, I generally, yeah, I would say three times a week on squat twice on dead three times a week on bench. And you know, there's, there's outliers when it comes to beginner, intermediate and advanced, I actually don't know. I mean, that does matter to some extent for sure. A more advanced athlete is going to need to have things a lot more meticulous, but especially on like beginners and whatnot, it's, it's pretty easy to do a lot with with a lot of varying variations so like i've had beginners i'll have squat twice a week and i've had beginners i'll squat four times a week and it really just kind of depends on the situation so that's the hard part with questions like these is it's so nuanced on the situation yeah like bringing up my lift ryan again he and i are built very similarly um our body weights are not too far off and i mean he's a little bit lighter than me but but not by much 
And our, our strength is very similar across those three lifts. You guys even kind of move the same. It's weird. And that's what I'm saying. Like when, 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 when Dylan sent me a video recently, uh, Izzy was looking at the video with me. She's like, oh, is that Dylan? I was like, no, like it's this guy who looks exactly like him. <laughs> but I, I would say that, uh, you know, I'm someone who, who thrives on a little more volume than he uses and definitely a little bit more. Uh, frequency for sure because I, I typically have done my best squatting under a three day per week uh, protocol. I've typically done my best pressing underneath a three day per week protocol. Uh, and if I've run him through something similar like that, it, it just it just puts him straight into a brick wall. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Okay, question number two: What's the most overrated exercise? No cap. Go off and rant. I feel like you'd rant good on this one. You go first. Oh, yeah, I did say I'd go first. I kind of want to think about this for a sec. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is belt squat, but we'll, we'll get there. And because, okay, so keep in mind, let's, let's, let's define this a little better. Overrated does not mean bad. Overrated means overhyped. Like, uh, I think, especially when I hear this question, I think culturally, what is looked at is this like amazing exercise, but it's actually not. Um, and funny enough, I think as you traverse, like all of you guys listening, as you traverse through your experience in powerlifting and strength training, you will find that um, there's a lot of things that go in vogue for a bit and then just completely disappear. Mm -hmm. And likewise, there's a lot of things that just stay around and just work. So most overrated exercise, I, that was more like a year or two ago, though. Everyone was doing the belt squat. <sighs> I'm going to give two on this. So the first one. Is going to be, and this is more for like building glutes and like totally in the realm of hypertrophy. Um, and the, it, yeah, so like the first one's going to be the hip thrust. There we I, go. Know, I know you have a special like story about the hip thrust, and I completely am on your side in that story, but I do think like for building ass mass. I think more chicks would be better off doing a lot of deadlifts, Romanian deadlifts, shit like that, as well as some hip thrust in there. But for some reason in the Fitspo world, like no one deadlifts, no one stiff leg deads or RDLs, but they'll do the fucking shit out of hip thrust and then do a bunch of booty bands or kickbacks and stuff. Dog and I pumps and hip thrust, baby. What's that? Dog pumps and hip thrusts. Yes, dude. Yes. Uh, that's like all you see. That's a 50 on frog pumps because I'm trying to, I'm not trying to get bulky. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's so funny because every bikini girl constantly complains about their ass. They're like, oh, I'm trying to work on my glutes. They just won't grow. The, the two things they're missing are fucking heavy deadlifts and eating a little bit more in the off season. If you just do those two things. Meanwhile, powerlifting girls, they're like, fuck, I can't fit any of my jeans. And they get like annoyed by how big their ass is getting. Same thing with powerlifting guys. It's a problem. Yeah, with me. I think if you want to blow your glutes up some real strict RDLs and stiff mm -hmm. legs done into a deep stretch. Those are going to blow you up more than hip thrust. I'm not against hip thrust and I do program hip thrust for some people, Same. Same. but uh, it's not, it's not like the primary movement. It's like, that would be the first thing that I would cut out. If I looked at the plan for the day and said, what can go here? Because the, because the lifter has, has to cut something due to like 10 minutes of time or something. I'd say, okay, pull the hip thrusts. I wouldn't say pull the squats. I wouldn't say pull the deads. I wouldn't say pull yeah. the pushes. I wouldn't pull an RDL. I'd pull the hip thrust out. That, and, that's and actually a really good way of putting it. That, that's like a really good way to conceptualize it. That would be my first thing too. Yeah, pull that out. You know, one of the that's, smaller exercises. That's not to say that I would ever write fluff into a training program, and I know you're the same way. Uh, but it's it's like, you know, if someone was doing an upper day and they had some bench and some dumbbell incline work and some some overhead work and there were some rope tricep extensions, I'd probably cut the tricep extensions before I cut the actual presses that are probably giving them more bang for their buck. Uh, the so hip thrust, rope? funny enough, is going to be my one. That's exactly what I was going to oh, okay. say. Okay, cool. Okay, because um, I know you have that, that, that whole, like, story, and I actually totally agree with that because I, I actually program hip thrust sometimes specifically for people who cannot facilitate their glutes well in an RDL or in their deadlift. Yeah. And that's actually a time I think they're great because it's like you literally just have to use your ass when you do it. And if you do it with, like, a squeeze at the top, it's a great way because for some reason powerlifters just act like the mind-muscle connection doesn't have a shit ton of science and, like, anecdotal evidence from bodybuilders behind its efficiency for improving technical and – um force output so uh definitely hip thrust and then real quickly for like a more powerlifting-esque answer 
Um, I think Dylan might disagree with this one. I don't know, actually. I don't know your thoughts on this actually at all, but this one's been around for a long time and I rarely program it. I do have one athlete currently doing, no, I have two athletes currently doing it, but the SSB squat I think is overrated. I see it programmed at like rates, especially in the USPA crowd that I think are just tremendously, it's like tremendously abused and almost used as a crutch when like someone like can't get their arms and just like a normal, even like a high bar squat. I'm just like, that's strange to me. Now I think the SSB has its place, but again, as far as like overrated goes in that realm of more the USPA, like untested side, I see them use SSB, like, like abusing it just all the time. And I just don't think it has that much application because of the resistance curve. I'll okay. listen to your input though. All right. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to touch on what you said about the SSB. Okay. Gonna touch on that first and then you can jump into yours. I'm going to defend that. And then I'm also going to defend the belt squat, but tell you why I think certain ways of using the belt squat are overrated. So first for the SSB, the SSB is a high bar variant, but due to the camera of the bar, it's actually trying to effectively roll you forward. It's, yeah. it's trying to pull you into flexion in your upper back. So what the reason why the SSB is so awesome is because you don't have your hands on the bar. You can't create that same tension and it rests in that high bar position. And you have to focus on driving into a neutral position in your back and holding it there when that bar is trying to buckle you forward. I know that my SSB squat is substantially weaker than my high bar squat. And if you just looked at them and thought they were the same, it's like, well, I can high bar squat. I can low bar squat. My SSB is weaker. It's, it's straight up more challenging for me to do the SSB than it is to do a high bar. It's easier for me to groove the high bar. I do think the SSB has its place, especially in lifters who struggle to maintain that positioning. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's um, also sometimes it's just a lower skill variant for some more novice lifters. Like I remember back in some of my personal training days, some of the first times that I would get a, a rote novice underneath the bar after maybe several weeks of building up their goblet squat capability, I would get them into an SSB for a few sessions before I actually taught them how to rack a bar across their back. Because my thought process, and I'm not saying that this is the only way to do it, is that that lifter has been using a front loaded squat, like a goblet squat for a while. And, you know, if I bring in, you know, a, a 40 or 15, 50 something year old individual who just has never really trained much and I say, okay, get underneath that bar, what are the chances they're going to be able to rack that bar well, right? Versus saying, okay, well, you're going to sit inside of this yoke, you're going to grab the handles, you're going to pin those elbows into your rib cage, or if they're really long in the arms, I might have them flare them out. And then they're able to still create that same good squat pattern. I also find that with the hands in front, they're more prone to closing off their rib cage and maintaining a ribs down position. Uh, whereas some novice individuals getting underneath a straight bar, they'll end up biasing towards extension really hard. Uh, but Let I me do ask like you this though. So I agree with all that uh, for the most part. Um, I think I approached the, the lifter coming to me doing, you know, front rack a little differently, but for the most part, I agree with all that. But, but I guess what my defense is more like, do you think it's like overrated in the sense, and maybe this is a perceptual thing of what I see on Instagram, but I just see lifters literally do it into competition. And I personally wouldn't program anyone unless there was like a very specific reason, like my elbows are just fucking trashed or something kind of reason. Like I wouldn't program SSBs like in any kind of like a meat prep. Would you? So I'll touch on Ryan Kicker again. Um, <laughs> okay. Who you saw how fast he squatted that two seventy five mm -hmm. seventy five kilos and his 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 best squat um, is two eighty and he hit that two seventy five like he could have done it for fucking three or four more reps I think it was snappy right I actually primarily have him SSB on another day and then only use the straight bar on another day on on his second day. Um, and that tends to keep him a little bit healthier in the elbows and the shoulders because when I've pushed his straight bar twice per week, his bench deteriorates because of his elbows and shoulders. Yep, yes. fuck, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's a time and a place. Um, but what I, what I think is an issue with the SSB is lifters who have very clear mobility issues, just using it as a workaround. Whereas uh, I really like using it as a, uh, a self limiting variation that is very challenging in that it's a high bar variant that tries to roll you forward. 
I got you. So that, that's Dude, where it, I, and it's it's uh, actually it's funny because I'm so good at extension. Like my SSB is incredibly close to my back squat. Yeah, um, like it's I'm super not. close. Huh? <laughs> I'm not. I'm nowhere yeah, near. Fucking dude, Garrett fears uh, SSB is literally stronger than his low bar, and he squats it deeper too. Like it's the weirdest fucking thing I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, okay, go. What are your two? So with the with the belt squat, I don't think the belt squat's overrated, oh, yeah, cool. but I think it became a bit of a fad there. Um, you saw a lot of people, you know, within the past two years, definitely like one or one to two years ago, like I felt like every other video I saw on Instagram was a bell squat. But the the idea of just like slamming all these 45s on, you've got your hands on the handles. Um, you're well, still like eight plates of fucking side. Yeah. And then I don't like the style of of sitting way back and almost letting your almost getting into like a negative shin angle, right? I'd rather create the same type of mechanics in a belt squat that I'm looking for in a standard squat. So frequently the way that I'll have people belt squat is either hands free and they can just kind of hold their hands out in front of them, or I'll actually have them grab a light kettlebell and they'll just rack it on the handle and then when they they step in, they hook up into the belt squat, unrack it, grab the kettlebell and hold it in a goblet squat or even hold it at, as a counterbalance goblet squat, like hold it like half an arm's length away from them. And I want them to focus on good, even full foot pressure and still maintaining the integrity of that, uh, of that core position and pelvic position as they're entering the hole. Because some people will say, well, you know, it's just loaded from the hips down, so who cares what the rest of my core does? But I just would rather not muddy the waters in terms of technique if I'm using that as a squat um, assistance movement. Well, not just that. I just don't understand that thought process. Like if, if you have a hard time coordinating your core during a complex low bar back squat at maximal loading, like why wouldn't you want to practice just coordinating your core Pretty much any time you can do it without like a huge drawback from it. Yeah, so, yeah totally. Yeah, exactly. I just was saying overrated or it used to be like uh -huh. in like 2019, 2020 era because like people were literally saying that's the best squat builder, like just in universal terminology. And like that's just not yeah. true. Like there's so yeah. many standards and ideas like where you would go outside of that. Um, but w funny enough, I think my, my biggest – pet peeve with the belt squat is more so that like type of belt squat hugely matters and most gyms have shitty belt squats if you have a pit shark the rogue is okay actually too um but but especially some of these weird lever ones where the rom is really yeah, short and it's like those one, i don't think it's the worst one i mean i'm sorry bells of steel oh yay yeah, 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 yeah. i'm sorry to have ever made that it is a pain in the ass to adjust the the rack height if you're working in with someone else who's taller or shorter than you and it's just awkward. The the Titan one is is similar. Um, I really only like the, I really only like the bit shark. But uh, yeah. to be honest, I, I think the the belt squat's kind of in a similar slot as hip thrust. Like, yeah, I program that for some lifters, but um, every one of these these exercises is a tool to be used. And there's a time and a place for each one of these tools. But I wouldn't say that it's a uh, it's definitely not a staple that I give everyone. That that's yeah. for sure. Uh, do you do you want to choose your own two or no? Oh, those were those were the two I was talking about, man. I thought. I oh, think oh, okay, okay, okay. Sorry, up. I thought I thought belt squat. You were saying like I thought you were making an argument against. Oh, I agree with you on the hip thrust all the way. That was. Oh, uh, okay, okay, okay. Gotcha, gotcha. Not absolutely. Uh, let's jump into the next one. Okay, next question. What is your favorite cue for squat, bench, and deadlift? We actually went over the squat last episode. We said foot pressure. Um, so I like it's, this question's really bare bones. Like, what is your favorite cue for squat, bench, and deadlift? It depends, but I'm assuming they mean like a general, movements. huh? I said those are three different movements. I know. Yeah, my, my so, is tight, tight, tight. Just start, just yell that at the lifter until they lift better. <laughs> dude, what's bad is like a lot of I'm, I'm, dude. I've I'm seen highly joking for anyone who does not know me out there. Please don't just yell tight at someone. <laughs> up go upwards <laughs> um don't go down um so yeah favorite cue for the squat bench and deadlift besides don't die um <laughs> so so for the squat in the universal sense the one that can apply to everyone that we mentioned last time that me and dylan actually agreed on was uh just foot pressure i think foot pressure is the number one thing i correct on people and weirdly one of the hardest things for some people to correct i know Lindsay has her issues with it i have a guy tyler right now it's just like no matter how many different ways I tell them to cue it and stuff. 
generally sometimes I have to just grab a lifter in person if I'm working with them in person and like nail their foot down. So yeah. there's that. Um, and then I would say for bench press, I don't want to give the basic ones because so many people know those. Like I would probably say like active scap retraction via like, like, like cueing, um, you know, bringing your chest to the bar, the whole rep, but like everyone knows that, especially if they follow my channel. So one that I say a little less commonly that I really like is outside palm pressure and squeeze pinkies. So like really getting that lateral force transfers huge on the bench. And then for deadlift, I'll let you shoot deadlift first. I just realized I started answering this first and this is supposed to be yours. Go for, go, go for deads. And then I'll, I'm going to touch okay. on. Okay. And then deadlift, you, I think you have to break this into sumo and conventional because it's very different. Um, I think for the, the conventional deadlift, I think it's, it's actually going to be, I mean, I don't have like a verbal cue I often give for this. I usually give like video demonstration, but actually learning to extend your low back as funny as that sounds like that's probably the most common thing. I see people who come to me who pull conventional, their low back just bleeds partially due to ab tension, but also partially due to like, they just literally either don't have the requisite mobility or don't have the awareness of their low back to keep it extended and tight, which can be really um, difficult. And that, funny enough, actually some sumo pullers deal with that too. So that'd definitely be there. But with sumo, I made a post about this and it's something that Dylan's incredibly good at is actually keeping your shoulders more over the bar. I think the number one mistake I see on sumo is lifters like fall behind the bar. So I like to say crane shoulders over the bar and maintaining that until you pass the knees um, because you don't want to try to get behind the bar too much. So those would be my three. Yeah. Uh, to piggyback on that, I don't think that at least in how I coach both the conventional and the sumo, it's not hugely different for me. And, and what I mean by that is I need to get the barbell above the midfoot I need to get the middle of the shoulder blades above the barbell and I need spine and pelvis set neutral, right? If the lifter is in position with a neutral spine, shoulder blades above the bar and bar above midfoot, they are more than likely in the position they need to be to initiate the lift. Whether And that's true for a conventional and that's true for a sumo you're going to have those checkpoints. Now, obviously there are more nuances to coaching a conventional and coaching a sumo. I'm not saying that they're the exact same across the board, but if I were to give someone my favorite cue there, it's going to be to try to establish that start position with shoulder blades above the bar, bar above midfoot, and take the slack out from that position, meaning get long in the arms, allow your shoulders to protract and Feel that vertical tension. So you're pushing your feet through the floor. You're pulling your torso away from the bar. Your arms are stretching out in between. And if you do that, you can easily just wedge in, bringing your shins forward to meet the bar, and you're right in the proper start position. But what does everyone do? They take a few breaths. They, they rattle the bar. They roll it around, and then they kind of lean back behind the bar. And that's always going to be less accurate in nailing that start position then establishing shoulder blades above the bar, bar above midfoot, slack out from that position, and then wedge in. In mm -hmm. my, mm -hmm. and you no, do I a told lot of that. I've actually shown um, shown your deadlift to to a lot of people on on that slack pull prior to the wedge because you get that bar, especially when you're up in you know the the sixes and sevens. That bar is is flexing like crazy while your hips are still up and back. Mm -hmm. Your back is neutral. Scaps are above the bar bars above midfoot and you just drive yourself into that start position building mm -hmm. that tension into the setup is is incredibly key instead of yeah. just leaning back and trying to grip and rip it there's um, actually so many high level lifters who don't do that and i i just see it and i'm like fuck i imagine what they would do if they did do that um it's, yeah it's crazy i i find that to be vital i super agree with your your point there's something to be said for someone getting to a high level and Sometimes they're an anomaly and they do things a little bit differently, but there's also something to be said for being successful despite some things that you're doing and not necessarily because of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, on to, to the bench press, I would like to cue keeping a long neck because I find that a lot of people mm -hmm. just end up getting really, um, really elevated in their shoulders. And especially like with the active retraction that you were cueing, some people have a hard time separating retraction from elevation because they just they will retract, but they'll end up shrugging into their upper traps anyway, especially if they're like a high arch bencher. 
And I find that um, being able to, to teach someone what a depressed shoulder position feels like and then being able to actively protract and actively retract while maintaining a depressed shoulder position, that's probably one of the most important things that someone can learn when benching, uh, in, in my opinion. And, and you can certainly use other variations of, of the bench press and just other press variations, even like, uh, like a push-up in order to teach that. But I think that one's absolutely key. Yeah, I think um, that that's the tricky part about retraction. End range uh, retraction, those high trap fibers run kind of vertically and horizontally, like at an angle. And so they actually do elevate the scap. And then obviously mid-low trap fibers are depressing the scap. So there is this like fight for like how much retraction, how much depression. But you're incredibly right. If you just constantly cue depressed shoulders, you'll never reach those high fibers to allow that elevation to happen. But it's yeah, long neck is definitely that was that was actually probably the one cue that I think helped my bench press personally more than anything else was like long neck yeah. cue. All right, let's hit the next one. Okay. Um, question four. Where are we at? What muscle groups are most important for building to have carry over to the big three? I feel like that one's kind of obvious, but maybe I can come up with like a more clever nuanced thing. I'll let you go first. So I, I don't know what level of lifter is asking this question. I don't either. I think that especially for like newer lifters, there's this race to get as strong as possible in those big three lifts. And sometimes mm -hmm. programming only, only accessory work that, is giving you like maximum impact on the squat, the bench, and the dead, deadlift can sometimes decrease your longevity in this sport. So, like, let's take um, everyone's favorite exercise clearly rear foot elevated split squats or Bulgarian split squats, <laughs> right? Most people don't love those. You see the memes on Instagram and stuff like that. I don't notice a big jump in my squat strength when I push my rear foot elevated split squats. I also don't notice a big jump in my squat strength when I do Cossack squats. Mm -hmm. I don't notice a big jump in my squat strength when I do a lot of like direct groin work, like Copenhagen planks. I don't notice, um, you know, a huge jump in my deadlift strength from doing single leg RDLs. Right. But all the movements I just listed are there to close in the gaps that I, that are appearing from spending so much time doing the big three lifts. It's important to look at not just what will an accessory exercise do for the big three lifts, but what are the big three lifts not doing for your body and what should you do with your accessories in order to become a little bit more optimal as just a, a, an athletic human being in general. So like being able to move into like a deep end range position in a split squat, even with like front foot elevated, it's going to take you into a way different range of motion than a, a low bar back squat will. And it's most likely a little bit too much of a variation for that to have direct carryover. Like your RFE squat went up 10 pounds per hand. Your squat didn't just go up 20 pounds, right? But I would venture to say that if, if you're already checking the box on your squat and deadlift work, and then you're feeding in a little bit of that other variation work that we talked about, it's probably going to keep you in the game a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, I'm a stickler for language. So I think I wanted to find this question more like the, the way they ask it, what muscle groups are most important for building to have carry over to the big three, the way I interpret that on first read is like building in hypertrophy sense. Mm -hmm. But I think Dylan touched on really like more like, like function almost. And I, I a hundred percent agree with that. I'm going to answer after, after you about what I actually think will build each three. But I think that, I think you have to, you have to understand what I just said in order to apply that understanding. Because if you just go in and say, do my big three and then only do accessories that are going to drive my big three, there may still be some big gaps in your abilities and you could dig yourself a hole that you might need to get yourself out of many years later. I, I actually, I don't even know if people realize like how big of a hole. So I think I like, I don't know. I literally, the only lifter I can think of that I know for sure is like, I'm sure there's some, but like that's torn more muscles than me is Matt Croc. Like I used to read about that shit back in the day um, or Janae Croc, I guess. But I, it's, it's one of those things where like, had I known how important like rear foot elevated split squats, training various ranges of motion were, 
to like stop your system from becoming like overly biased to certain repetitive overuse injuries, I would have been doing that shit like crazy. Um, so yeah, like I definitely think training those more intricate, tinier functions and end ranges and muscles, uh, go a long way, specifically the adductors and hip internal rotators and, um, yeah, just moving a little differently. I think that's huge when it comes to like building or like inciting hypertrophy for more. So, so here's the thing, like if you, if you induce hypertrophy, muscular growth, you, essentially the theory goes that you're going to have more potential for strength adaptation because there's more potential for neurological, uh, adaptation, hence from all the, the, you know, extra motor units and whatnot. And so I, the obvious answer is build your quads, build your pecs, build your shoulders, build your back build your glutes. Um, but I think the, the areas where I tend to see a lot of lifters lacking, especially in the more modern sense of powerlifting, the, 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 some that come to mind are like kind of just the pressing muscles in general. There's a huge theme right now for like arch your way or sumo your way to a total. And I think that's a quick way to a plateau in the long run. Even if you are really good in a huge arch. And even if you are really good in a like very wide stance sumo with a short and ROM, all my lifters who do move like that, I still ensure that their conventional is extremely strong. I still ensure that their feet up bench press or Larson press is extremely strong and that they're putting on muscle mass for injury prevention reasons and for uh, the reasons of just like having more potential to overload. Once you do cap out that technical prowess and like that short and range of motion. Um, and I think that's why you actually see some guys kind of plateau up there. Um, so, so I definitely think like just upper body, like, like bodybuilder muscles are probably the most lacking. And I think that's the thing people need to focus on the most. And then obviously the prime movers, your quads in a squat are going to be the prime driver. Your glutes and the deadlift are going to be the prime uh, driver. So yeah, that would be mine. And, and this question was specifically what muscle groups? Is that yeah, correct? What, what muscle groups, but I, I feel like they, they probably meant like not just muscle, but like joints and like, like everything, yeah. like an all encompassing, you know, functionality yeah. approach. Um, so I, I don't know if the person who asked this question will like the way that I'm going to answer it, but I, I'm, I'm not going to respond with a specific muscle group. I'm going to talk some more movement patterns that I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair. Um, so, so if, if I were to try to deliver the biggest bang for your buck with a squat and, and to say what's going to drive your squat up the most, I think it's really hard to argue with literally just squatting more really, really well. Uh, if you have not gone through any sort of um, higher rep squatting ever, or you just hate it, I think you should probably give it a try. Uh, some of my my best squatting has been done alongside some some fairly high rep ranges, even double digit. And most people think that's crazy when they're like, "Oh man, like why would I do want to do more than a set of five or something like that?" And they think that it's it's absolutely. Uh, you know, a death grind because they've got to do eight reps on a squat for repeated sets. But I, I would say push your actual rep work um, and, and, and really lay that, that clean foundation, that wide foundation of uh, a fair amount of work capacity there from that rep work. Well, and you mentioned move well, and I think that's key. Yeah. There's a way to do a Mark Ripito squat. And then there's a way to do a squat that builds your quads, which was my problem for years. The second I started squatting correctly, my quads grew. Okay. And, and there's something to be said too about those higher rep squats and keeping a little bit more sub max. So you stay in the, the knee extensors when you're coming out of that hole, yeah. especially if you have an extreme hip dominance. Yeah. I, I mean, if I was trying to blow my squat up, it would be low bar squat, high bar squat, front squat. And those would pretty much be the three variations that I, that I would train and I would push a sizable amount of volume on those. Um, for most people with the bench press, I completely agree with you about training those bodybuilder muscles. I mean, just literally doing more bodybuilding style, upper body accessory. I'm not just saying go do curls and side raises, although that stuff has its place, but get out of just that horizontal range of pressing, um, do dips, do incline work, do high and low incline work, do truly overhead work. And then if you're doing that alongside benching, you're going to get strong at pressing at, at a variety of angles there. And I've found that varying the angles with which that you press helps to prevent some of those overuse injuries because you're not just hitting bench press into a close grip bench, into a dumbbell bench, into a push up, right? Which are effectively very similar movements there. 
uh, by varying the angle that you're pressing, I think that's key to being able to develop a, a wider range of, of which you can be strong within. Mm -hmm. uh, for the deadlift, being able to lock in that core position is absolutely key. So being able to uh, brace neutral, you know, things like ab roll rollouts and weighted planks, uh, back extensions, things like that. If you have core weakness, you absolutely need to address that. But assuming that you can maintain a neutral core position, at least under these submax loads, I've come back to this answer time after time about the deadlift. Do pause deadlifts. And I don't mean like an Instagram pause. I'm talking like a full two-second pause, really low to the floor. Just a couple inches, maybe two to three, maybe two to four inches off the ground, full two-second pause, and then accelerate out of that pause and really snap and stick that lockout. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree with all that. Um, and I, I don't think people understand the way the core, uh, specifically interior core muscles and hip flexors work in a deadlift to maintain spine neutrality. A smart mind who's not quite as educated, but intelligent would say, well, isn't the thing that prevents backgrounding in a deadlift your lumbar extensors in a traditional functional isometric uh, strength sense? Yes. But the hip flexors, because uh, those and the TVA draw the core in and create rigidity in the interior core, those are actually hugely responsible for keeping your back from rounding, which is why beltless work specifically gets really, really hard because to, to keep your back straight because you remove that um, proprioceptive effect of the belt hugging your abs. Yes. Um, yeah, so I think ab wheel and, and abs in general for deadlift – it, it I, I actually think that's like probably the, the most profound answer there because I don't think a lot of powerlifters actually take their ab work no. serious. I mean, it, go go do beltless front squats for like four or five working sets of like let's let's call it like I don't know like six to ten reps or something like that. Tell me you don't feel your abs the next day. Yeah. Right. And if you don't, I'd love to see the video of your front. Yeah. Squat. yeah if you don't, <laughs> the video, we will critique it live on the show. <laughs> we'll be nice. Dude, I've had I've had 500 pound squatters in in um uh fucking uh 74 kg class. Um, I've had them come to me and not be able to front squat 225. I had a 300 kilo squatter couldn't front squat the barbell with he, he literally just didn't have the ankle mobility or the overall mobility in general to even like zombie front squat the empty bar. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, those, those are important things to, to and, build and, up. And actually that's a really good point. If you think about only what, if you only think about what work is going to drive my squat upward, mm -hmm. you just may become that dude who can squat, you know, six sixty, but he can't front squat an empty bar. Yeah. Don't miss out on the opportunity to fill in those gaps now while they're small. Dude, totally. Well, and and what do you think will happen if over the course of your training career, you train your ankles through more dorsiflexion, more quad dominance when you get to that 660? Maybe you can totally get there without ever doing a front squat. But how do you keep getting to the next point? Like, how do you really maximize your genetic long term potential? I don't think anyone would could make a coherent argument as to like just being overly comp specific when you look at it in that conceptual light. That just makes no sense to me. Yeah. Like, why wouldn't you train your ankles in a different range and your quads in a different range? That'll just essentially give your system more capacity to have more potential in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, wh were we question five? Yeah, question five. What this is an interesting one. What foods do you eat regu regularly? To maximize performance, I feel like everyone always mentions macros, but rarely mentions practical food sources. Okay. This one's interesting. Um, I, I already know this one because I've talked about this in nutrition videos. Like I can give really specific answers here. Do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. Uh, I used to eat brown rice all the time. <laughs> and I thought that, you know, hey, that's, that's the healthy option, right? gassiness, bloated, right? Just not, not digesting as well. When I transitioned to eating jasmine rice, it was just an absolute game changer. I felt an uh, immediate, complete release of all that gassiness and bloating that I would have. Uh, and I just generally felt better. So most of my meals throughout the day, like let's say like meal two three, through like maybe meal five or so, probably have some jasmine rice alongside it. Um, I do, I run my rice cooker every single morning. Um, I usually have some oats and eggs and stuff like that in, in the morning for breakfast or I make a shake um, with, with some of that stuff blended. But jasmine rice has been absolute key. And 
overall just finding food that you digest well and tolerate well because let's say uh, eggs for example my wife can't have them because it, it just wrecks her gi and she only found that out after going through an elimination diet protocol and then gradually feeding back in like one food choice at a time but I digest them just fine. So like we have eggs on hand, but they're for me, right? And finding foods that, that work well for you, that's that's the most important thing because what works well for me, what works well for Brendan may not necessarily digest well for you. And more importantly than you know, eating chicken breast or eating bison or eating ground turkey, you need to find something that agrees with your body. Yeah, I think that's huge. A lot of people actually don't know this, but personal trainers and coaches and whatnot – um, in a lot of the states in the U.S., uh, I know for sure in California here, uh, you are not allowed to give to your clients specific food recommendations. It's illegal unless you're a registered dietitian or a doctor. So, um, which I have my own gripes with that because I've met some really bad registered dietitians. Like I had one who put a six foot five, two hundred and thirty pound lifter of mine on thirty grams of protein over a really inaccurate assessment of like while he was weight training, and I told him I was like. We shouldn't train if you're going to eat this low protein. He wanted to anyway. And then finally he realized like, oh my God, my body feels destroyed. So uh, just saying like registered dietitians don't always know, but I do think that's kind of a good rule because there's a lot of dumb personal trainers out there. And like what works for someone else is definitely not work for other people. And I, I think, yeah, that's a great answer. I was going to go a completely different route and I will in a second, but gut health and digestion and things of that nature are, are play huge roles in your recovery as well as just like your overall well being and, and whatnot it was increases inflammation in the body. Mm -hmm. You're like hugely if you feel gassy and bloated every time that you're eating, like what why are you eating that food? Like yeah. if you feel that way, take note of whatever you just ate and then don't eat it. Right. Or I showed up at your house just like farting every 10 minutes because I had all those quest bars on the airplane. I was just yeah, like ripping yeah. ass so bad. Yeah. You were you, you were like, you were like, dude, I ate like four quest bars. I have so much gas. And then what, I had something in the in the pantry that was like protein related. You're like, oh dude, like let me make some of that. And I was like, no way, man. <laughs> that right now. You, you can eat some real food. You're not eating supplements anymore. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> <laughs> it's low key. It's funny because yo, I usually don't give a fuck. I just like I'm really polite about it. I like walk in another room. I'm like, sorry, Dylan, I'm about to go rip ass in your other room and make sure you can't smell it. Izzy still has not heard me fart yet, and it's like we're gonna keep it that way. <laughs> um, so my my foods for um so so okay, I have like a, a bunch of videos on nutrition, and my big thing is like most powerlifters and especially even bodybuilders, uh, more so back in the day, but even in a modern sense their diets are too restrictive with micronutrients and like a variety of food sources. So um, again, you want to check with your allergies, you want to check with your gut and you actually like, I think a lot of people who are really sensitive to foods probably actually should have like a legit professional who's in both their realm of like the, the lifting realm as well as like, you know, a registered dietitian of some kind, probably take a look at their diet and sometimes elimination diets are good. But with that said, um, main things I always make sure I get is some form of a leafy green, specifically spinach or kale daily, uh, vitamin A and K is kind of hard to get. Those fat soluble vitamins are really tricky. So I really hammer those. Um, I always get some beans or lentils of some kind. Again, you got to be careful there. Some people actually get really gassy off of those. Um, but yeah, beans or lentils. Um, yeah, I always have like some kind of like carb source. That's like a rice of some kind, same thing, Jasmine rice. I don't do well with brown rice. Um, and then I also make sure I'm getting some kind of like your basic, it, it's not, I hate when people say the healthy fats, like that, that's not accurate. Like saturated fat is actually a healthy fat too. But the problem is most Americans and Western diets have too much saturated fat and they lack the omega threes and sixes and some of the other fatty acids. So ensuring you're getting some kind of fish or like nut butter. The problem there is like mercury poisoning is a way more common issue than people realize. So that's like something, and the way they test for it is not super accurate. So fatty fish. And then, um, there's like other things too. Oh, and then like citrus fruit. I always make sure I get citrus fruit for the antioxidants. So one big thing that Dylan mentioned that's so accurate, inflammation is your biggest enemy as a lifter. So if you've ever wondered why lifters tend to age faster, there's two reasons. Um, protein intake. Uh, well, there's also gear use, but we'll leave that out of this context. But 
Um, protein intake uh, actually speeds up cell regeneration and thus the cell life cycle. Uh, but the other one is high inflammation rates um, cause a lot of issues with like uh, aging of your cells and skin and thing like that. And so the more you can combat inflammation, the better. I actually chronically take vitamin C every single day. Uh, I take upwards of about 6,000 milligrams uh, per day as That's well as like storm. storm, man. What's that? That's why you were so damn gassy. It's the fucking vitamin C. No. So, so, okay, here's the thing. So vitamin C, once you pass for most people at 2000 milligrams in one dose, especially a male, that's where you start to get the uh, gastric issues and like the GI stuff. Right Below that, I'm actually really, really good. And funny enough, when I don't have that, as well as a lot of citrus fruits, I actually fart way more. Uh, and I don't really actually know why that is, but um, yeah, so I, I get a shit ton of vitamin C, a lot of like antioxidants. And then I also supplement, I just recently got, um, I think it's called athletic greens. I'm not sponsored by them. I pay for this myself. Is that what it's called? Athletic greens or whatever. Yeah. I, know yeah. I, I throw, you have that too. I have a, I have a, a different one. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I do like a greens and or a greens and red supplement. Uh, mm -hmm. most of the time when I do my breakfast shake, it's mm -hmm. egg whites, uh, that greens and reds powder. Uh, which is just like a, a chocolate flavor and then some peanut butter and oats. And I blend it up a little bit of cashew milk in there. Just hit it in the neutral bullet and ease. ease. Yours is chocolate flavor. Yeah, mine is. Fuck man. I need to get that one. This one tastes kind of like, eh, but I throw I it into this big concoction. Flavor. So it's better. Yeah. 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 So those are the main things I have videos on this though. So go check out the YouTube channel and then yeah. Uh, make sure your gut health is in check. Um, okay. Next oh, question. Can I just put a tip on the gut health stuff too. Oh yeah. yeah. Go, if, go for if, it. If you're not doing it already, psyllium husk and glutamine are, and a greens powder like that are going to be absolutely awesome. Um, and then I would add a probiotic in there too. A lot of the greens and reds powders also have a probiotic blend in them, but if you can take a, a high quality probiotic and a greens blend, uh, I would just do that in the morning. And then maybe even if, uh, if you have some, or if, if you want to go the extra mile, some digestive enzymes too, because that can help to break down um, all that nutrition that is in that greens and reds powder. A lot of them, again, will have like a digestive enzyme blend alongside a probiotic blend. Just read the nutrition label of whatever you're buying. Make sure you've got some digestive enzyme blend in there that's going to help break that down. Uh, and then psyllium husk is really great. Uh, most, most Americans don't have enough fiber in their diet. Um, so jacking up your fiber content is going to be really good. Be really good. I like to drink. Um, I think I have around like it's maybe like five or six grams of psyllium husk. It's an orange flavor. Uh, it's called Colon Cleanse. It's on Amazon, and it is going to help clear you out. So first thing in the morning, I put that down with some fluid, and uh, that's that's going to get to work pretty quickly. And you're going to. That's interesting. I, I haven't experimented with this. I want to yeah, try that. I do. I do a large dose of psyllium husk when I wake up, alongside a whole bunch of fluid. That helps to just get things rolling. I usually have, I usually have a meal maybe like uh, within an hour of waking up. But I like to hydrate first, mm -hmm. um, get some electrolytes in me, and get some get some that psyllium husk in me too, and help get things moving along. Um, and then also glutamine, which is incredibly important for gut health as well because the actual bacteria in your gut feed on that. So you could do something simple like 10 grams of glutamine alongside some psyllium husk, greens and red powder, uh, probiotic, and a uh, digestive enzyme capsule and wash that all down together. And that's a, that's a great gut health stack right there. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, I want to try that. I think that that's interesting. <laughs> We're talking about poop. Um, I, I always have this problem where in the morning I'll take a shit, then I get to the gym and I take a shit. And then sometimes after my caffeine, because of that dehydration effect in the cut, I have to take another shit. So I wonder if that would just condense it all into one and just completely clear me out. That would be actually very nice. So I don't have to go to the bathroom so often. Give it a try. Give yeah. it a try. I'm going to give that a try. Yeah, I need to get better. this show sponsored by colon cleanse. <laughs> <laughs> we just like, hello YouTube. And there's like a fucking colon cleanser ad. Yeah, that's great. Um, hey, if they want to pay me and support the channel and I actually believe in it, I'll do it. But for real, um, all of us as lifters eat so much damn food. Oh, like take care of your gut. 
you so know? Much. And it's it's like contrary to what people think, they're like I think sometimes people think like bodybuilder diets and stuff are healthy, and they are in some regards, but they're also very incredibly unhealthy in other regards, like the constant spiking of blood glucose, the the digestive issues because you're taking in so many calories due to your high uh, energy expenditure. There yeah. is a lot of drawbacks with like the diets we have, and you have to account for those in like how you approach certain things. So yeah, hundred percent. Okay, moving on from poop. Um, <laughs> question number six. Do you believe in specificity or variation more for the bias of your programs for athletes? In other words, do you err on the side of the USAPL comp specific approach with lots of singles? Or do you like more variation of exercise and rep ranges? I hate I hate the way that's worded because that's not um, that that's not indicative of the way that everyone in the USAPL trains, that it's just like doing singles and nothing but comp lifts year round. I think that's a very watered down way of explaining how an entire organization of, uh, of members trains. Well, I think what, what's happening is that, that this is what's wrong with the highlight reel on, on Instagram though. There, yeah. there is like a very prominent like crowd who does that in the USAPL, but you're right. Like, you're a high level coach in the USAPL. I am too. And we don't necessarily like bias towards that. And, and I really think um, systematic approaches like that in general are broken, but go ahead. I'll let you take this one first and I'll go. Variation, um, higher degrees of variation farther out from the competition. I only keep variations in uh, that are driving progress or, or maintaining a certain degree of technique for the lifter as we get closer to it. So like if, if I notice that when I pull a certain squat variation out, like if I pull pause squats out for a certain lifter and they start to see a little bit of drop in their performance, then sure, we can ride pause squats all the way in. And, and same thing, like I've, I've had lifters who still did front squats, you know, two weeks out from a meet. Like it's not like you have to go into all comp specific. Sometimes even the harder you push those, those comp specific days in your week, Sometimes the more variation and a little bit more of like a, a reduction in intensity you need on some of those lighter days. It's almost like sometimes the, the heavy days get heavier and the lighter days almost have to get lighter sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I definitely like to use variations chosen strategically to uh, help close the gaps that I keep mentioning on this show uh, in the lifter's abilities. And the farther out we are from a meet, the more leeway I have with what I can do. And the closer we are to the meet, the more I have to just reach only for those movements that are, go that are going to help drive the big three lifts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Um, yeah. It's funny. You're, you're going to watch the matrix later and there's this huge reference to binary thinking. Um, and I, I, it's so funny that they put that in there because that's been my go-to term lately. I, yeah, I really hate. That is a binary, binary question. Yes, exactly. Yeah. it is. Yeah. And I really don't like binary thinking, but I do think there's something to this simplistic, reductive uh, conceptualization and language that you can use with this kind of thought process. So I'm going to answer this the way they asked this, and then I'm going to answer it the way I think it should have been asked slash answered. So if I had to choose, I probably compared to what this person is visualizing the USAPL. I do a heavy comp single on a squat and deadlift and bench and then back off fives and then, it, you know, whatever and tapers and stuff. I definitely tend to err more towards what you would consider variation, but there's a lot of time and a place where I have heavy singles in, in the off season for my lifters, squat, bench, or deadlift. It just really depends on, on the, um, you know, specific situation, but I definitely err a little bit more on the side of variation, especially in the off season. And then when we get closer, traditionally specificity rises, but not always like exactly like what Dylan said is huge point. The, the awesome thing about a front squat is it's just not that fatiguing and you can push that a lot more than you could. Like if I have someone doing like a tertiary day uh, comp squat, they're going in that 60, 50% range. And I can actually get their loads on a front squat near that same exact objective loading, like number on the bar, but their exertion's higher and yet it doesn't fatigue them going into their heavy day as much. We did that on one of our cycles and I really liked having like something where I could just mentally push myself a little bit more going into that heavy day. So I tend to err on the side of variation a little bit more, at least in the way that ask that. I think the problem with asking that though, is that's really not how all coaches and lifters program. Yeah. And I really think, um, I I'll say this. I, I do kind of see, like, I do think 
a lot of the USAPL coaches that I've seen at the highest level are a little afraid of higher reps. I think the number one thing that I really took away from Dylan when we started working together was like, don't be afraid to do some tens and even twelves on squat and, and even deadlift deadlift. I already kind of knew, but especially with the squat, we did a lot of high volume. So I will, I will say there is kind of like this bias in powerlifting as a whole that like your squats don't really go above sevens or sixes. And the only time you'll go like eights or tens or more is like when you're on a belt squat or a variation. And I don't agree with that. So that's kind of, I'll, I'll give you that answer. But traditionally speaking, if you want to have like a, a fluid model to follow and don't get glued to this, don't become binary and concrete to this. But generally speaking, in the off season, you're going to have more variation. This is going to give your joints a reduction in loading. It's going to allow you to build up those uh, kind of intricate muscles we were talking about, focus on some non-specific things, have a little bit of a mental break. There's a lot of benefits there. And then as we get closer to competition, we'll probably see a little bit more rise in specificity. And I think that's kind of the easiest way to answer it. Yeah, I agree. Cool. Question seven. Oh, this kind of ties into earlier. Um, best glute exercises. Sorry, I know you're. Oh, I think they meant to write male. So it got like they put makes, but I think they meant male. So sorry, I know your males watching won't care about this question, but I used to love your videos on training glutes back when you worked with Noel. Also, can you do more videos like this in the future? Um, so just to answer that one, cause that one was specific to me. Uh, yeah, I can definitely do more. I do want to like, I kind of hate how male dominated my audience has become the last four years. So I definitely can do more videos on that. Um, it's just hard when I don't have like a good female example to like showcase. Um, and I don't like projecting too many of my clients publicly on my YouTube channel. Um, but anyway, uh, best glute exercises, I'll start this one. Um, so <laughs> We kind of answered this earlier a little bit, and we also kind of gave away the answer. I think that was fun here. Uh, I think the hip thrust is slightly overrated. I do still use it. Um, I'm going to break this down in modalities slash like, yeah, I guess paradigms to some degree. So I think you kind of have like your overload exercises, and that's going to be your deadlifts and your RDLs. Um, those kind of come to mind first. And specifically, I think the sumo deadlift probably has the most um, – anatomical like functionality like like when taking into account anatomical functionality the sumo deadlift is probably the best exercise for like putting tension into the glutes as an overload exercise but the problem is is for some it is kind of a shortened range of motion um but that's not everything it's not it's not always like range of motion based so the conventional deadlift and rdl typically due to the structure of the way or the orientation of the way the fibers run, they're usually going to train kind of higher outer glute. And then sumo deadlifts are going to just target the glutes more as a whole, especially like kind of mid and low glute. Um, and then actually hip thrust when done a certain way can really target those low glute fibers. Uh, if you get a posterior tilt going and really work on core neutrality and squeezing at the top. So I'm going to have my overload exercises. Those are going to be number one um, because I can't just say like, one best glute exercise uh after the overload exercises i'm usually going to go to what i would call like assistance lifts which are kind of in between something like an isolation exercise and like an overload and that's going to be your hip thrust in some cases like an rdl variation like a dumbbell rdl or a banded rdl or something or so something along those lines and then i'm going to have more of your isolation based exercises which are going to be like your glute cable kickbacks your um you know more reductive exercises that just remove any kind of demand of coordination and allow you to really target the glutes. And you're just going to want to have all these pieces within your program if your goal is to in incite as much hypertrophy as possible. And I think one thing I see done well in the bodybuilding slash bikini slash figure community is they really focus on creating good awareness of glute through a lot of like isolation exercises, but they get way too carried away with that. And like we said earlier, they never hit up those big heavy exercises. Um, likewise in the powerlifting community, I see a lot of girls and, and guys alike deadlifting really heavy, but they actually fail to ever create good facilitation of their glutes, which is a common problem. And so you actually might want to do some hip thrust or some, you know, even some glute cable kickbacks. I've actually literally prescribed uh, powerlifters to get them more aware of their glutes. And so, I think figuring out what's missing from your puzzle piece is probably going to be the best answer here for what's going to make your glutes grow. So if you're doing a shit ton of isolation exercises, throw in a lot more heavy, especially like high rep, heavy deadlifts. 
And then uh, if you're the opposite, I would try to facilitate your glutes a lot more and get a lot more like um, control there, especially in certain areas that might be underdeveloped. Like if you find your low glutes are underdeveloped, get in those hip thrusts, especially heel dominant, you know, pelvic tucked uh, hip thrusts are going to be awesome. Yeah. So first off, if you are already performing squats and deads on a regular basis with some moderate amount of training volume and your glutes are very underdeveloped, Again, we would love to see the video uh, footage yeah. of how you lift, right? Because chances are your positioning is not very good. Uh, I see a lot of people deadlifting in a posterior pelvic tilt, lumbar spine flexion. They're just kind of gripping, ripping off the floor. They're moving it from point A to point B, but they're not doing so with a hip hinge. If you want to learn, if you want to grow your glutes, you need to learn how to hinge at the hips. And mm -hmm. that hip hinge is present in a squat pattern. It's present in a deadlift pattern. Um, it's present in a lunge. It's present in a single leg RDL, right? So being able to do that well is first and foremost the most important thing. So before you think that you need to add something else for your glutes, you may need to do the exercises you're currently doing better. Now, if you're already doing them well, I like some fairly high rep work on a deep squat. So something that's like a high bar variation that's going to keep you nice and upright, really reaching deep in that hole. Big stretch, a lot of tension on the glutes there for sure. And then a uh, deficit RDL, something where you're standing up on an elevated platform where you can hinge super deep into a big stretch in the bottom. That's going to blow up not only your glutes, but also your hamstrings, right? Um, if now, if you're one of those people who just wants to blow up your glutes and you want tiny quads and tiny hamstrings and some weird bubble butt work, <laughs> uh, neither one of us can help you because that's only going to come from a BBL. <laughs> Bro, fuck that. Um, yeah, hey, and that actually that brings up another point. So uh, another little takeaways is don't be afraid to train the fucking uh, little intricate muscles. So like the glute meat and men are heavily underdeveloped, which actually causes technical issues within powerlifters, especially in their squat, um, because they're reaching a deep hip flex position and trying to cue. Uh, you, you need active external rotation torque, but passive internal rotation mobility in a squat to have like a really nice squat. And so having some single limb RDLs and some split squats and just things of that nature in there are heavily important for ensuring your technique and your mobility and stability are on point for optimal maximization of uh, distribution of tension within your squat. And then same thing with those facilitation exercises. That's, that's, that's the thing is like, if you don't use your glutes in the deadlift, there's a high chance you're just not feeling them or aware of them. And that, that's actually why, like I'll take, I, back in the day, I got a lot of clients actually from Noel was mentioned in this who came to me that were like, yo, I want you to coach me. And there's these girls who like kind of competed in bikini, but they were like interested in a strength oriented approach and had fun with that. And the one thing about coaching all of them is they have like amazing body awareness, especially in the lower half. They just moved so well and their mobility was good. Their stability was really good. I never had to fix that. Meanwhile, I get these power lifters and I'm just like, bro, how are you not broken right now? Like, how are you not fucked up? And it's because they just move so bad and have all these like compensatory like patterns that are built in from years of neglect and over abusing um, like bad movement. So that's kind of worth mentioning. Yeah, that's exactly what I was mentioning earlier about filling the gaps in your abilities before you become that person. Yeah, exactly. Um, question eight, what's the biggest advice you get? Wait, I, yeah, question eight. What's the biggest advice you'd give your younger self in regards to lifting? I like that question. This is really specific, though, because what I would tell myself is not necessarily what I would tell my audience. Um, Dylan, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, I would tell myself to take trips and vacation more often. You can still train. You can still stay on top of your nutrition. I found ways to do that really well. My wife and I travel a lot. You know, and we talked on the last episode about how on top of that stuff now. But I remember, I remember back then being like, "Oh man, I really want to go snowboard," but like, I got to meet in like eleven weeks. So like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and these days it'd be like, "Yeah, fuck yeah, let's let's go hit the slopes." Like, I'll just hit hit the gym beforehand. I'll wake up early. I'll wake up at four thirty in the morning, smash a workout real quick, and then have breakfast and hit the slopes or something like that. But uh, yeah, I tell myself just to. Look, you're in it for the long haul. Every every workout does not matter as much as you think it does. Uh, I would tell myself to probably lay off the caffeine a little bit. You know, if you need three to five hundred mg of caffeine before you train, maybe you just don't love training as much as you say you do, right? If you have to get 
blitzed out of your mind to get in the gym, you really should analyze like why that is. Maybe you just have a caffeine addiction masquerading as a, a power lifter, right? Because yeah. it, it allows you to slam a bang or two per day. Shout out to Leon. Uh, <laughs> Bro, I've so never much, seen someone drink so many fucking so much caffeine, but dude is just even keeled. He's just he's just right here. Just I'm like, I'm pretty sure I've been like recommending meditation to everyone in my life in my circles, but I think if Leon meditated, he would just disappear from reality. <laughs> he, so zen. he would just like sit on the couch and then like his body would disintegrate into nothingness. He would go to the beyond. Yeah. Um yeah, and then uh, let's see, and then um I, I would I would tell myself to not get fucking fat. <laughs> I, I do think there's something to having a little bit of a more dirty yeah. bulk experience. No, I, I know. totally I, agree with this one. Me at like 242 was just like way too roly poly. Like I'm not saying that I couldn't have laid down some body fat here and there, but uh, you know, I, I, I got so locked into like, okay, just push, push these numbers and screw the body comp for a while. And, and, <laughs> In the past few years, once I've like reeled that in, like I did the bodybuilding show, and I like, absolutely love just getting shredded and just just taking. It's not a, it's not about walking around with a six pack all the time. It's it's just about kind of taking more pride in your appearance, you know, and, and the general state of your body. So like I enjoy doing conditioning on a regular basis. I enjoy doing a wider variety of exercises. I enjoy structuring my nutrition in a way that's more performance based while actually maintaining a more aesthetic physique year round. And these are things that I wish I could go back and tell myself when I was younger, for sure. Yeah. I, um, <laughs> the running joke is I'm allergic to t-shirts. That's what my clients and uh, <laughs> friends in my gym tell me. Cause it's like fucking 40 degrees in our gym and I'm shirtless. Dude, I, I love to, for me, when I'm showing my physique, I always maintained a super lean physique year round all the way until about 2016, 2017. And then I just couldn't do it because it wasn't sustainable at the time with all these injuries I was dealing with. So I decided to get heavier because I just had so much more cushioning on the joints, you know, and so much better leverage when I got heavier. And I did that for like three and a half years to finally break through some of these plateaus and it was well worth it. But now that I'm back to being lean again, I mean, fold minutes. Um, I just love, feeling good about my body. Like I, I don't think that's a bad thing to have your shirt off and feel proud. Mm -hmm. And that's just personally, I like it. You know what I mean? And so I think, you know, those things can actually be really beneficial. And I totally agree with that one. I definitely got really overly fat one bulk in particular. This was back. I was weighing like 165 fresh into lifting, like just got done with like marathon running and shit. And these power lifters convinced me. And mind you, these are really bad power lifters. I don't know why I listen to these guys. They convinced me to bulk to 198, like, like above the 198 realm into the 200s from 165 in like a three month span. And I admittedly could do that so easy because I love eating. And so, so I gained like so much weight over the course of a few months and got super fat. And then I literally ended up losing strength in the long run of that year because I had to cut all that back off. I like regressed so much on my movements and was feeling like tired and beat up and stuff. And so definitely agree with your advice there. I think for me personally, my biggest advice I give my younger self is less is more. Um, I just, I always have that mindset, like more is better. More is more, you know, like I, I pushed too hard on exertion. I was actually still dealt with that until I started working with, with Dylan. Um, I would try doing too many exercises in one day. Uh, I'm not kidding when I say it wasn't uncommon for me to do like 12 to 13 exercises in one training day, which is absolutely absurd. I'd be in there for like three and a half hours. Um, just less is more was definitely my big thing in an entirety, uh, of that. And I would also, yeah, I would tell myself kind of actually the opposite of what Dylan said. I, I went on, I think, too many like vacations and gave too little fuck sometimes. Like I would put so much effort into the gym and so little effort into like my recovery and like staying on top of that. And so I was on the other end of the spectrum where I was like neglecting a lot of things that could have like added up to more results early on. Um, I would be really on top of like the diet and whatnot, but I would just go travel, get like horrible sleep for like a week straight and like still train crazy through that. And I wonder why I was always injured, you know, <laughs> those would be mine. Um, these last questions are fun. Question nine, who are your favorite lifters? <laughs> oh man. You, you want me to go? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I feel like both of us feel the same about this question. I, 
don't enjoy watching powerlifting or lifting that much. If I do, it's actually usually something of like strongman or weightlifting. Uh, Clarence Kennedy is actually one of my favorite people to watch. So he's definitely up there. I really enjoy Clarence Kennedy. Um, in the powerlifting scene. Oh, okay. I'll give you this. I like uh, Angelo Fortino. I think his name. I feel like he's someone who's just really technically evolved and approaches his training incredibly well. And that's like motivating for me to watch because I don't necessarily think he's this like genetic freak at the top of the game. I feel like a lot of his success comes from his approach to training. So I enjoy watching that. And then Pete Rubish, dude, like what the fuck, like all that hype back in the day, I fucking love people who hype up and I just enjoy watching that shit. So Pete Rubish back in the day was really, really fun to watch and anyone just screaming and bleeding out of their nose there, I for sure am watching their videos. If you guys go watch Pete Rubish's 800 beltless pull, something around 800 pounds where he just grinds it out and goes fucking crazy after one of my favorite videos to watch before training. Yeah. I, you and I are on the same wavelength with this question for sure. You know, it, I, I have so much respect and, and admiration for, for anyone who's engaged in pushing to the highest levels within any strength sport. But I'm not over here fanboying and watching watching footage left and right with like a, you know a top ten list or something like that. The people who I love watching lift the most are, are truly those who are, are closest to me. So it's it's the lifters who I coach. It's Brendan. It's uh, my buddy Matt Cronin, Asian Matt Cronin, not white Matt Cronin from Stoke. He's Africa. really strong. Yeah, yeah, he is right. He's really strong. He's fucking strong. Uh, he and I. He actually brought me out to my first powerlifting meet back in the day. Um, you know, it's watching my wife lift. It's, it's watch, it's watching my friends and training partners lift and whatnot. Um, I, I, I really, I think that's the best answer I can, I can give. Bro. I'm such a narcissistic douchebag, but I, I like watching my own videos. I really do. Oh man. Favorite lifter. Go for it. <laughs> Bro. I wish, I wish there was a few more, you, you got to use it with, you know, some, some respect, but I wish there's a few more people who hyped up a little bit more these days. I'll tell you this. What I don't, what I hate watching is if a lifter looks like they're not trying and I get it, I know they're trying, but like sometimes people are really casual about it. And I don't know. I just, I personally just don't enjoy watching that. Me and Dylan both talk about this. We both have a kill switch that we can engage. And it's funny because the older we get, the, the more we realize engaging, that's probably not the most mentally healthy mm -hmm. thing in the world. But when you engage it, man, is that fun to watch? Man, is that like when you squatted 485, um for for that 10 that was a fun fucking set to watch you yeah know? yeah it's it's like that switch is like deep inside of our minds with like a break glass in case of emergency <laughs> you know we're just fucking punching right through and flipping that switch but yeah it's gotta be used uh only once in a while you can't bust that one out every day yeah 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 i find myself so like actually last meet I uh, was not feeling the best on deadlifts because of my grip and the bar they were using was off. And it was just a long fucking day. We were deadlifting at 4 p.m. after it's starting at 8 a.m. in the morning. I mean, it was such a long fucking meet. And so deadlifts just didn't feel hot on second attempt. Third attempt, I went into a private room at our gym and watched some shit that put me in like a really dark spot for a minute. And I like, came out there, pulled that deadlift. And then after it was crazy hyped and then like hyperventilated again in that same room and everyone thought i left They're like where the fuck did he go he disappeared but i was like in the room with my hand leaking blood just like hyperventilating and it's so it's it's like can be a little dark sometimes but it's fucking it works and it's fun finding balance there is hard uh last question of the day what's optimal number 10 what's optimal body fat percentage to walk around at Oof. again binary but this is this so binary. Take that one first yeah you want me to take that? Yeah. Yeah. How do, Okay. <laughs> I know. All right. So 6.5%. Yeah. yeah. How do you feel? First of all, male or female, <laughs> right? We're not just, it's not one number for both. How do you feel physically? Not just when you're in the gym, but also outside of the gym. How does your body feel? Uh, do you like the way that you look? Okay, these these are important things, and and someone might say, "Fuck it, I don't care. I don't care how I look. I just want my numbers to go up." Cool. Talk to me in ten years. You probably will, right? And if you don't, wait another ten. Talk to me. You're going to reach a point where you're like, "Oh man, I really wish I wasn't three hundred plus pounds." Right? Um, mm -hmm. Brendan is very lean, and I've been that lean. I was I was I was incredibly lean when I was going to the bodybuilding show. I can you're tell you. Than this. You were fucking peeled. 
Yeah, I can tell you that that powerlifting training at that percentage for me was not happening. Um, mm-hmm. It's not that I couldn't do it. It's just that I didn't feel as – my joints didn't feel as resilient um, being – being really diced so there's kind of a happy medium i I still have visible abs like when i pop my shirt off but i i I don't need to have like veins coming through my abs like while i'm training now now brandon on the other hand he he's got veins popping out of his abs while he's lifting and and he feels great and he's and he's pushing himself and he's recovering well and his body feels good so that is really an individual thing Uh, i would say if you're if you're a little bit higher on the body fat side and you want to start bringing your body fat down, just pay attention to how you're feeling in your training. You know, if, if you start to feel like, you know, injuries keep popping up left and right and your body just doesn't feel good at the body fat percentage you're at, uh, you know, maybe take that into consideration. Maybe you need to change your training style a little bit if you want to go through a period of the year where you're ultra, ultra, ultra lean. Uh, versus a time of the year where maybe you feel better when you've got a little bit more cushion on your body and you're training slightly differently, but it's really not. There's that's such a binary question. It's not something that I can just say, oh well, you know, eight to ten body percent body fat is going to be optimal. Like what what is what is optimal? The very definition of optimal means that there's going to be a difference from person to person. We're not all the same. Yeah, it's so subjective. So like it's exactly like you said, especially my deadlift and even the squat when I'm on top of my like you know, auxiliary movements, uh, those feel really good at this body fat percentage I'm at. And in fact, I feel like the best on deadlift I've ever felt. Meanwhile, my bench press though, admittedly, like if bench was a big goal of mine, I would definitely be way heavier. My, my elbows and shoulders are just getting fucking beat being this lean. Like they just, that's where I have the worst attachment points. Like on my triceps don't have big thick joints in the elbow. So the more cushion I have there at heavier, um, body fats, I are a higher body fat percentage. I just feel way better on bench. So it's, it's super, uh, independent. And then on top of that, yeah. Like where's the person at in their like training career, you know, like if someone's really just pushing overall mass and like weight on the bar and we're going through like a year long, like let's fucking get freaky strong and big. They're definitely, I'm going to have them floating at a higher body fat percentage, but creeping slow in their gain. One, one mistake I see people make is they cut. And then they gain way too fast. You don't need to gain fast at all. People really don't understand that. Like for for some reason from the model of like calories in versus out Seco, they've really like adopted this, like again, binary thought process of like, there's like this on switch of gains and off switch of gains. You're cutting switches off. Not true. You can actually build muscle in a cut. Likewise, when the switch is in a big caloric surplus, it does not equal like if you're eating an extra thousand calories a day, you're not going to add any extra muscle compared to if you're in a smaller surplus. Um, as long as your recovery modalities are in place. And so I think the key is to gain slow, but find exactly what Dylan said, that range where currently you just feel good at. And that's going to be different this time of year compared to next time of year because your goals and your lifting style might be different. So there's so much to take into account there. Um, I have varied a lot. I would say I was closer to like 18 to 20% when I was um, spending these last few years a little Sorry, heavier. Did you say that again? Sorry, my fucking Siri watch. But um, now I'm walking around, you know, 10 to 12% most of the year, like really, really visible abs and, and veins everywhere and lines on my legs. So it just kind of depends on your overall goals. Uh, I, I do this because I realize, especially being a content creator, people really want fucking numbers. So I'm going to give super big ranges here. But I would say for like males, anywhere between as low as 10, but that's going to be very rare. Uh, to as high as about maybe 22%. But there's going to be like times where I've had just heavier guys who compete in the one twenties. They're walking well above 22%, but that's just because their goal is fucking powerlifting. And they're like, Hey, I'm not as concerned with my health right now. I'm not as concerned with these things, but like that 10 to 20% range for males, for females, give it a 5% bump, 4% bump, something like that. You know, 15 to 25 is probably where I'm going to keep them somewhere in there. But that's just so hard for me to even say that. Yeah. Yeah. cool man this is a good q a we got it done we're like nailing our times too it's about an hour and a half almost exactly hour 22 minutes dude thank you for for coming on um so this this 
podcast, guys, was a little special. If you guys, though, have any topics that you feel really hard hitting for future episodes, we will be collecting a lot of questions uh, every time we release one of these. So if you guys have questions you want answered, leave them down below, especially if it's a very good universal question that could be applied to many people. We will cover that in future videos because we always do at least a short form Q&A towards the end of every podcast. And we'll catch you guys there. Thank Dylan for coming on in the comment section. Uh, his link to his coaching stuff will be in the description box. And we'll catch you guys in the next video. See you all later. Yes.